Good morning and welcome to the Hub City Church. We're so glad you've decided to join us in worship this morning. If you're new to Hub City, we exist to make disciples who believe the gospel, abide in Christ, and obey the word of God. If you'd like more information about our vision, if you'd like to get connected to biblical community through groups, or if you'd like to find an opportunity to serve the body of Christ with us, you can visit our website, thehubcitychurch.org, or just text the word Hub City to 97000 and we'll follow up with you in the next few days. Don't forget, tonight is our May play day at 4 o'clock. In lieu of community groups, we will have a fellowship in our backyard with burgers, birthday cake, and a giant water slide to celebrate our church's 15-year anniversary. We hope to see you there. Also, Promotion Sunday is next Sunday, June 4th at the beginning of service. We will honor all preschool, fifth grade, and high school graduates with a gift and pray together for them as they move into their next season of life. As we get ready to enter into corporate worship, if you're worried about having little ones in service with you, we want you to be at ease. We love kids and have a lot of them here. There are coloring sheets in the back of the sanctuary. Our kids ministry is always available to you. And we have a nursing mother's room with our service streaming live just outside the lobby to the left. Again, we're so glad you're here. Let's worship Jesus together. All right. Well, hey, good morning again. My name is Tad Anderson. I'm the lead teaching pastor here at the Hub City Church. And on behalf of our church family, we're so glad you're here to worship Jesus with us this Sunday morning. And uh, if I could just say, you know, um, I'm so glad it's graduation weekend. You guys really have your clapping and your, your praising on point. Maybe you say a little bit, of, a little bit of that for my sermon. I'd appreciate that. You know, just a little bit of encouragement up here. I always appreciate that too. So, um, anyway, uh, hey, just one announcement before we get to the word, and that is our May play day is this afternoon. Woo! All right, so 4 p.m. Um, our May play day is something we've done for a few years running uh, as our start to the summer uh, break and break from community groups. Um, but this year we're celebrating something really important. That is our 15 year anniversary as a church. Okay. And so we're going to, uh, grill out burgers and hot dogs. We have, uh, Sam's cookie cake, which is the best by the way. Um, one of the community groups is bringing sides. I believe if you're not in a group, uh, yet, but you want to contribute, you're welcome to bring a side as well, or just come and eat all the stuff that's going to be here. Cause I'm pretty sure it's going to be a lot. So, um, anyway, we'll, we'll also have a sizable water slide for the kids and for the adults who are brave enough to risk hurting their back. Um, as well as some other safer yard games to play, cornhole and whatnot. So it's going to be a good time of fellowship. So come uh, eat and hang out with us as we celebrate 15 years as the Hub City Church, okay? Um, well, we're in a teaching series through the New Testament letter to the Ephesians. It's called Life Together in Christ. Um, and we, we called it that because the, the first half of the letter is a uh, lengthy and beautiful articulation of gospel doctrine. And then the back half of the letter is mostly application of that doctrine to individuals, uh, families, and churches who are doing life together in Christ. And we spent the first three weeks in the Apostle Paul's long, winding, and doctrinally deep introduction on the will of God to glorify himself through the redemption of the church in Christ. And today we'll finish up this first chapter uh, by discussing Paul's prayer for the Ephesian church. So let's go ahead and we will uh, we'll read that and then we'll pray and we'll dive in. We're picking it up in verse 15 of Ephesians 1. Paul says, for this reason... Because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, 
that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. Father, we thank you again for this day and the grace that you have given to us as your church through the years. It is a great joy to be able to celebrate with this people 15 years of faithful gospel ministry here in Crestview. I pray that in your kindness, we would have at least 15 more, and that you would do exceedingly more than we could ask or think as we strive to keep doing the same mission, the mission that you've given us of making disciples who believe the gospel, abide in Christ, and obey your word here in the Hub City. And, And Lord, now as we dive into your word, God, in a passage of which the meaning might largely be assumed, I pray that we would, by your Spirit, give legitimate thought to if we are being faithful in this area and commit to growing in it if necessary. God, I am painfully aware of how I, no matter what I say in the next 40 minutes, um, it can't produce that result. I can't produce that result. Only you can. And so I pray that you would. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, last week, or the week before last, I should say, um, a giant pastoral voice of our time, Tim Keller, passed away. And if you have heard me teach for any uh, sustained length of time, you know that I quote him frequently because uh, he has just said so much so well, along with countless uh, young pastors, I learned so much from him and his articulation of the gospel. And in his book on prayer, he begins the book by telling a story from early on in his time pastoring Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York. Uh, it was in the, the wake of 9 11 and 1999. Kathy, his wife, was suffering from Crohn's disease, and he was later actually diagnosed with uh, thyroid cancer. And one night, in in that challenging season for them, Kathy said something to him, he says, that changed them from that day forward. She said this, imagine you were diagnosed with such a lethal condition that the doctor told you that you would die within hours unless you took a particular medicine. A pill every night before you were going to sleep. Imagine that you were told that you could never miss it or you would die. Would you forget? Would you just not get around to it some nights? No. It would be so crucial that you wouldn't forget. You would never miss. And so she concluded, well, if we don't pray together to God We're not going to make it because of all that we're facing. I'm certainly not. We have to pray, and we can't let it just slip our minds. As of the writing of that book, Tim Keller said that they had yet to miss a night 12 years after that conversation. And so based on the longevity and and genuineness of that change in their life together, I can only assume they maintained that commitment up until his death the previous week. What a powerful testimony that is, right? Um, I I won't presume to impose that same rigorous standard on your life and your marriage, though uh, honestly, I don't think any of us would be uh, at a loss for considering that kind of a commitment. 
Who here among us would dare say that they could stand to pray less? (laughs) I've been a pastor long enough to know that literally none of us will say that. And most people in this room will say that they are discontent with their current level of prayerfulness. Maybe this little story is the motivation you need to grow in your own prayer life. And if so, um, I'm glad for that. But that is not the main thrust of our discussion today. Yes, we're talking about prayer, but I I assume most of you um, would say that you know you ought to be praying and you strive to pray on some regular interval. But in our passage this morning, Paul is talking about his prayers for the Ephesian church. I'd like to zoom in on the semantics here, because I think it may prove relevant and helpful to us, okay? He says, back in verse 15, he says, For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, get this, remembering you in my prayers. And from that, church family, I'm about to blow you away with my high degree of acumen Uh, for Bible interpretation. So brace yourselves. I think from what Paul says, it would be safe to gather, okay, that we too should remember our church in our prayers. I know. (laughs) You're impressed with how I drew that principle so insightfully out of the text. Okay, I'm being silly. Um, it's, It's not that hard to draw that out, is it? Uh, In fact, I'm willing to bet you didn't even need a Bible verse to tell you that this morning. Okay, Uh, On the list of Christian shoulds, you would have thrown prayer for your church on that list. right? But let me split hairs a little bit on his wording. He, He doesn't say, I pray for you. He says, in my prayers, I remember you. Right? Now, maybe this is only a problem that I have had, but I'll just share it anyway. Some people have had the experience of being asked to pray and even committing to pray for a specific request and then forgetting to pray for the specific thing that we were asked and knew we should pray for. It's probably just me. <laughs> Probably just me who's had that problem a time or two. Maybe not you. But in the event that there's anyone here like me, here's what I would say. We've got to get better at that. We've got to get better at that. Guys, prayer is essential to the Christian life. One pastor said regarding the relational aspect of prayer that prayer should be like spiritual breathing to a Christian. That's how often we should be talking with God. Without ceasing. Another Bible teacher said, regarding the effectual aspect of prayer, prayer moves the hand of him who moves the universe. So prayer is essential to the abiding nature of our relationship with Christ. We should be uh, frequently, throughout each day, interacting with him in conversation. But Jesus also taught us that when we pray... God hears and responds to our prayer, okay? Now, I know you you probably know all this already, but I'm just priming the pump for those who need a little reminder. Scripture commands us to pray frequently and fervently, not as a religious box that we have to check, but as a great privilege that we get to do. Prayer is not about have to. It's about get to. We get to have a relationship with God. And so so we should take advantage of that. And because prayer is incredibly effective, I'd like to exhort us real quick. Many of us, I'm sure, have been guilty a time or two of saying something along the lines of, well, all we can do now is pray. Guys, (laughs) We should feel really dumb for saying that and aim to never say that again. Because when we say that, what we're saying is, well, all we can do now is approach the throne of the all-powerful God of the universe, who's also our Father, and ask Him to work in our lives like He promised He would. Oh, is that all? (laughs) Is that all? 
Prayer is not a pea shooter. It's the big guns, right? Prayer isn't meant to be our last resort. It's meant to be our first impulse. And so we should strive to be people who figure out some way to remember to pray generally and who routinely remember to pray for our church specifically. Okay. The church is God's chosen vehicle for accomplishing the mission of his kingdom in the world. Right? Arguably, there's nothing more important than that in our lives. So our prayers should reflect that. Okay, Just a couple scriptural supports for this before we move on. In 2 Corinthians 1.11, Paul says to the Corinthian church, he says, you also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. So clearly, Paul would agree with our rationale so far because in this verse regarding his, his apostolic gospel ministry, he says, prayer is a real help to us. Prayer is a real help to us. And thus, when a whole church prays for us together, that's a lot of help. That's a lot of help. Guys, let me just say, I know this might sound super elementary, okay? But our prayerlessness reveals that we still don't believe it like we should, right? Prayer is a real help, and a whole church praying together is a lot of help, okay? Okay, one more reference. Later in Ephesians, we see that Paul commends uh, what we've already been saying about praying fervently and frequently. But listen to what else. Ephesians 6.18, he says, Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So in this verse, he's saying that our remembering to pray should be thought of in this category of like ongoing unfaltering spiritual alertness. And he says, in that mindset, we should be making supplication. Supplication is specific and wholehearted asking or pleading for a specific request. And he says we should be doing that for who? All of the saints. Wow. I'm just going to be real. That that's a huge command. How can we possibly do that? Well, before we move on to the more specific things Paul prays for uh, the church as a whole, I want to give a couple things I think would be helpful for our obedience um, to pray for all the saints. First of all, I want you to think about, for a second, I want you to think about this, all the things that you individually have hoped for and prayed for for yourself. This year, so far, almost six months, okay? <laughs> There's probably been some desperate prayers in there, I'm willing to bet. Some pressing things in your life that you were really desiring that the Lord would act on or answer in some clear way in your life, right? That same thing is true for this whole family of believers, just last week, I had a friend ask me to pray for one of his kids who was concerned about a potential difficult medical diagnosis. I had another friend ask me to pray about a big potential job change that would really help his young family in the next season of life. I had another friend ask me for prayer about uh, a son going through the hardest part of Marine boot camp. Another friend whose father passed away. Another friend was needing wisdom for a tough conversation they needed to have with a fellow believer. I could branch out more, but I won't. I think you get the point. That's one week. And that's just a handful of, of people that I have proximity to. Okay. These are things that really matter to these people, right? And that have spiritual significance in their lives. These are saints, right? And think about how many prayers like that there are that I didn't mention that exist in a church body like this with upwards of 150 people. 
I'm not saying this to overwhelm us and lead us to not pray specifically for each other. No, I'm saying we should be mindful of praying for as many as we can that we know about because prayer is a real help. And a lot of prayer is a lot of help. And we all have things in our lives that we feel like we need a lot of spiritual help for. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah. And so here's the last thing before we move on. I, I think we, right, HCC, the Hub City Church, I think we need a mechanism of some sort to help us do this well. Our community groups pray for one another weekly, but I thought it would be good for us to have another more centralized reminder to be praying for the other members of our church regularly. And so in the lobby, you may have noticed during our rebrand, our name change, that we made one of our lobby walls a prayer wall. If you haven't noticed it, Go notice it after service, okay? Um, some of you guys have already been like, oh, I'm going to do that right now. And you've already slapped a prayer request up there. That's great. But for anyone else, here's what that's all about, okay? It's a way for us to be making supplication for all the saints, okay? There are prayer request cards on the, the right side of the wall that you can fill out, and you can add your name to it, or you could mark it anonymous if that seems best for you. And then you can pin that to the wall, And as you do, each week, our elders and our leaders are going to commit to pray with you on whatever those pressing things are in your life. And I would encourage everyone else to make your way by that wall and not only add your requests, but to commit to pray for as many others as you can. And here's the final part. As your prayers are answered, there's a stamp on the left side of the wall that says answered for you to use and the Lord responds. And we want you to use that so that we can not only pray for one another more faithfully, but rejoice together when God responds to our collective prayerfulness. Okay. So I hope you'll join me in this just like with the evangelism tracker, remembering our church family in prayer is something that we want to know and be able to see is really happening. Okay, we want to know this is really happening as an ongoing reminder that we need to. Uh, we sorry, we need one another's prayers, and that the prayers of an entire church actually add up to be a lot of help to one another. Okay, all right. So check that out when you leave service. Today, But moving on in our text this morning, uh, along with remembering to pray for the members of our church specifically, we should also be praying for our church collectively as well. And the Apostle Paul gives us just a really good frame for this. Uh, As always, this passage is so dense, and so there's a ton that could be said. A lot of it we touched on already, and so I'm not going to get into every uh, word here. Okay, But the Apostle Paul and his prayer for the Ephesian church... Um, says that our, really he helps us understand our prayers for the church should be uh, understood with these three, these three things, okay? And so I want to apply that to us as the Hub City Church. So here's, here's number one. The first thing I think we should pray for our church. We should pray prayers of thankfulness for our church. You don't seem moved by that. All right. <laughs> Duh. We should pray prayers of thankfulness for our church. Okay? So as Paul is remembering the Ephesian church in prayer, he says, For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you. And the reason I can say super confidently that this is a general principle is because Paul says this about almost all the churches that he ministers to. Right? Right? In Romans, he says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because of your faith that's proclaimed in all the world. First Corinthians, he says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus. Philippians, I thank my God and all my remembrance of you. Colossians 1, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. First Thessalonians, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. So you can see similar language is used in reference to all the churches that Paul is praying for in our collection of his epistles here. He's, he's praying thankful prayers for them. That's the first thing he says. 
He's praying thankful prayers for them. And crucial for us to see in verse 15 of our text, Paul says why he is always praying thankful prayers for the Ephesians in particular. He says, it's because he heard of their faith in the Lord Jesus and their love toward all the saints. Okay? So if we were to boil that down, I think <laughs> these are really the two things you want to have in a church. Okay? A solid faith in Jesus and an observable love for one another. Okay? I think we could argue that that's, you could really boil it down that far. Okay? Now, I'm a little biased because I'm the pastor of this church. But also, just a little secret here, as the pastor, I know a good bit of the issues of this church too. And so I think I'm qualified to say it's a good one. <laughs> I think it's a good one. It's not perfect. Okay? Don't hear me say that. It's not perfect. We have things to get better at. We're a work in progress. And we have a lot of sinners here. I'm one of them. But I think there's a solid faith in Jesus and an observable love for one another that's continuing to grow here Amen. in this body. Okay? And so I would encourage you to remember your church and your prayers with thankfulness. Because churches that preach the gospel faithfully, that is, who maintain sound doctrine, and love people well, that is, have a healthy culture, are increasingly rare. Right. These kinds of churches are increasingly rare. I think what you see in our cultural moment is that it's, it's becoming hard to hold these two things in tension. Okay? There are some churches that major on sound doctrine. And so they're preaching the word faithfully. But as Jesus predicts, as the end draws near, the love of many is beginning to grow cold. And so you'll have churches that can exposit the Bible with the best theologians. But there's a coldness. There's a coldness, even sometimes a, a meanness in them. They've forgotten that our mission is not just about doctrinal accuracy. It's also about spiritual efficacy and a vibrant community. We're not just here to hunker down and maintain our conservatism. Okay? We want to see spiritual and numeric growth through love happening. Love of one another within the church, hospitality, the sharing of our resources, and also the loving of people outside of our church, right? Through evangelism, acts of mercy and service to those in need. That's one side of the spectrum. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, there are some churches who left the pursuit of sound doctrine behind in, a, in an attempt to be all about love. Okay. And these churches, they might do really well at making people feel welcome and accepted, but they grow a mile wide and an inch deep. Right? There's no depth of understanding of the orthodox faith in them. No challenge to grow as a disciple who's equipped for the work of ministry. They're trying to have a, a healthy culture relationally, and maybe on the surface they do, but here's their secret. It's maintained by spiritual lethargy. Right? It's just a bunch of people who say they love Jesus, but who never stretch or challenge one another in their faith. It's as though their motto has become, come as you are and stay as you are. Come as you are and stay as you are. No need to ever talk about sin and repentance because that would risk making people feel uncomfortable. And we're here to love people, not change them, right? In these kinds of churches... 
Lots of time and money is spent on having ministries that effectively make people feel like they belong. And that's not wrong. People should feel like they belong to their church family, right? But in these same churches, very little effort or thought is given to how people can become who God has designed and called them to be in Christ, right? But of the Ephesian church, Paul says he's thankful because they have a reputation of being focused not on one or the other, but of both and. Sound gospel doctrine and a healthy culture of love, right? And as I said, while no church is perfect, I think this church, the the Hub City Church, is at least striving to maintain this tension that that characterizes the Lord Jesus himself, whom John says is full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. It's not an easy thing to balance. Just going to be real. As one of the guys who's trying to figure out how we balance all that. But we believe that it's what we're called to do and increasingly be. Right? And the Apostle Paul's thankfulness is instructive to us, right? Should just breeze over that. Should just, you know, move right past that. We should be praying thankful prayers for our church because what we are, we are by his grace alone. It's no one person who's making our church the way it is, it's an ongoing group effort empowered by the Holy Spirit. So if we're not already in the practice, let's pray regular prayers characterized by thanksgiving for our imperfect but biblical church. Okay. The last thing I'll say about this is that committing to thank God for your church is also, not just something we see we should do here, okay, but It's also a great offense against some things that really threaten to harm the church. Thankful prayers for your church are a great offense against some things that threaten to harm the church. First of all, praying thankful prayers for our church regularly helps to guard our hearts against division that will occasionally try to crop up and cause relational strife and bitterness within the family of God, right? It's really hard for bitterness and resentment and a divisive spirit to grow in prayerful people who are thankful for their church. It's hard. It's really hard for those kinds of things to grow in a heart like that. Also, thankfulness in your prayers to the church guard against a cultural mindset of consumerism that defines much of the American church these days. If you commit to thank the Lord for your specific church family that you have covenanted with, then you're not going to be prone to constant church hopping in search of the unicorn, right? The non-existent, perfect church, okay? But you'll be grateful for the imperfect one that you're part of. Just another word on that. If you found the perfect church, unfortunately, when you joined it, it would be perfect no longer. (laughs) Give that some thought. And finally, prayers of thankfulness for your church will cultivate your heart to think less in this consumer's mindset of what can my church do to better serve me and more in the biblical mindset of what can I do to serve and make my church better for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, So this may seem like a no-brainer, that we would pray prayers of thankfulness for our church. But it's usually 
the things that we think are the most obvious that we're actually in danger of forgetting and that we could stand to do with greater intentionality, okay? So that's number one from our text. In our prayers, we should remember to thank the Lord for our church. Here's the second thing. We should pray that our church would grow in true knowledge of and hope in God. We should pray that our church would grow in true knowledge of and hope in God. Paul says, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, or the riches of his glorious inheritance. In the saints. So again, there's a lot there. Tristan talked about some of that in his offering talk. We talked about some of that leading up to now, okay? But um, here's what I would say in summation here. Paul is saying that he prays that God would further open the spiritual eyes of the Ephesian church so that they would grow in their knowledge of who God is and that they would understand their eternal hope as Jesus' church. And here's why. Here's why I think he prays those two things, okay? For knowledge of and hope in God. Because genuine knowledge of God leads to right living before him. And genuine hope in God leads to a right degree of trust in him. Now, just a minute ago, we're talking about this healthy tension, right, between grace and truth of sound doctrine and a loving culture in a church. Now, to take that a bit further, I would place before you that how well we actually know God is directly proportionate to how faithfully we obey him or do what he says. Okay, How well we actually know God is directly proportionate to how faithfully we obey him or do what he desires. So the greater understanding that we have of biblical truth, the more gracious people we should be. The more sound our doctrine, the more loving our culture should be. You following me? Let's go back to school. The two should rise and fall together. If sound doctrine is the x-axis, okay, and love is the y-axis, there should be a linear increase. I say that right, math nerds? All right. Some of y'all just graduated high school. You should be able to tell me if that's right, right? Okay. (laughs) And to the degree that that's not happening, then what is happening is we're not really getting to know God. We're just getting to know more about him, which is not what we want, right. right? That's actually not what we want. Let me give you two biblical examples of these different kinds of knowing. Okay. On one hand, in Scripture, okay, when a man and a woman get married, the term that is most commonly used for the intimacy that results between them is that they, do you know? They know one another. They know one another, okay? Follow me. And if marriage is a picture, and it is, of Christ and his church, then you can see how our intimacy with God should involve getting to truly know him and what he's like as we abide in his word, okay? So that's one. Picture. On the other hand, 
in the gospel accounts, whenever Jesus encounters demons who are possessing people, many of these demons say something eerily similar to him. They say, we know who you are, son of man. We know who you are, son of man. So the demons recognize and know that Jesus is God. (laughs) The demons recognize and know that Jesus is God. They know a good bit about him. At one point, they're like, what are you here for? You're here to torment us before the time? (laughs) So they know a good bit about the timeline and what's supposed to play out here, right? But they don't know him intimately like his disciples do, right? They don't love him. They don't trust him. So these are two kinds of knowledge of God, knowing about him, who he is in a merely intellectual way, and actually knowing him intimately and having an active, ongoing relationship with him through prayer and the study of his word. And the latter, I would argue, is the work of the indwelling Holy Spirit that grows us in our obedience or right living before him. Right? We see this correlation in several places. In Titus chapter 1, verse 1, Paul says this. He says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of of the faith of God's elect, and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. You see that? (laughs) He says the same thing in 1 Timothy 6. He talks about the teaching that accords with godliness. In 2 Corinthians 7, he says, Since we have these promises, beloved... Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. In other words, since we've come to know how good God is and how gracious he's been toward us, let us then conform our lives to the good design that he lays out for how we should live. Okay, That's the knowledge of the truth that accords with godliness. One more, Hebrews 10 In verse 23, it says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And you could put, and as a result, between those two verses, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Right? So you're seeing the correlation here. So all this is saying, Paul prays that the Ephesian church would grow in their intimate knowledge of God so that as their eyes are open to who he is as their glorious heavenly father, they would increasingly grow to obey his commands and be conformed to the image of his son. But he also prays, okay, and thus we should also pray that as a church, we would grow collectively in our hope in God, not just our knowledge of God, but our hope in God. In the same way, that genuine knowledge of who God is grows us into right living and biblical morality. Genuine faith or hope in God will grow us into a right degree of trust for him in our daily living. If knowledge of God leads to biblical morality, then hope in God leads us to the biblical mission. Morality, knowledge, mission, right? For hope. Knowing God intimately will cause us to strive for purity in our thoughts, words, and deeds. Trusting God deeply and really having our hope in the resurrection will cause us to reframe our lives for his glory. 
structuring things like our time and our budget to serve and to be generous to our church, to live on mission in our day-to-day lives, and to lead our families to love him as well, right? This is a, this is a cause and effect relationship. Do you see it? Amen. Paul models for us prayer that our church would grow in true knowledge of and hope in God because genuine knowledge of God leads to right living before him and genuine hope and God leads to a right degree of trust in him. So let's pray thankful prayers for our church, and let's pray that we would grow in our genuine knowledge of and hope in God. And finally, number three, we should pray that our church would walk in resurrection power. Okay? We should pray that our church would walk in resurrection power. He says... And that we would know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand uh, in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. And we talked about that authority aspect of Jesus, that he will reign, right? That he's going to reign supreme in the end. And that's the assurance of our salvation is wrapped up in that, right? So we talked about that already. But this is a pretty mind-blowing thought here. Right at the end, Paul's saying that in Christ, as Christians, we have available to us at our disposal the same power that God used when he raised Christ from the dead. (laughs) I don't think we get that. Maybe it's because we're Baptists. I don't know. But like, we don't get that like we're supposed to, I don't think. That as the one who has authority over all things, Jesus imparts that power to us by his Holy Spirit, in order to accomplish all that he has set out for us to do. So Paul prays this for the Ephesian church, that they would walk in resurrection power, as it were, and we should pray the same for our church. Because our mission cannot be accomplished In the flesh. Our objectives are supernatural. Okay. Our objectives are supernatural. Again, we see reference to the need for this power throughout Paul's letters. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul talking about how he came to the Corinthian church. He says, In my my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom. Sometimes I feel like that just babbling, rambling along up here, right? But he said, but, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 4, he says, for the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. In Colossians 1, again speaking of his ministry to the church, Paul says, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. And in John 6, Jesus himself says of the supernatural nature of gospel ministry, he says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The flesh is no help at all. You see, guys, we, as the church, as Jesus' church, we've been tasked with one very simple and yet impossible task. Make disciples. And We'll see this in our text Next week in chapter 2 of Ephesians, but 
our task, our, our, our main thing, okay, our main thing is to preach the gospel to spiritually dead people without eyes to see or ears to hear the truth of the salvation it offers. This is not a natural work. This is not a natural work. We're not selling solar panels door to door, okay? We're calling people to confess that they're not enough. You know, like, I am enough. No, you're not. You're not enough, right? We're calling people to confess. They're not enough. Their wisdom, their strength, their morality is not enough. And to repent of their sin and turn to Jesus Christ in faith, not just as Savior, but also as a Lord, and to radically reorient the rest of their lives according to his teachings and the ultimate promise of eternal life. This is not natural. In order to do this, and in order to live that same life ourselves, of taking up our cross and living as missionaries until Jesus returns or we die, this takes power. This takes power. Without resurrection power, it's impossible. We can't do it. This is why Jesus says in John 15 that he's the vine, we're the branches. Because apart from the power that he alone supplies to those who are connected with him, we can't do anything. <laughs> we can't do anything that he calls us to do. All right. Understanding this, 19th century American evangelist R.A. Torrey concluded this. He said, We're too busy to pray, and so we're too busy to have power. We have a great deal of activity, but we accomplish little. Many services but few conversions. Much machinery, but few results. Prayer is the key that unlocks all the storehouses of God's infinite grace and power. Amen. He said this nearly a hundred years ago, friends. And yet this is truer than ever. It's truer than ever. Apart from the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, guys, like my whole life is staked on how this church does things, right? Like I, I care a lot about it. But it does not matter how many church services with a great band and relevant teaching that we have. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how relatable, and instructive our discipleship ministries are. And it doesn't matter how many truly helpful city outreaches we try to pull off. We cannot do what we are called to do in the flesh. That is without God. Our objectives are supernatural. We need to be walking in the spiritual power of the resurrection. And so, friends, in closing, the message of this sermon is really simple. We must remember to pray. We must remember to pray. And specifically, we must remember our church in our prayers. We must rem remember our church and our prayers. If we really believed that everything that we're doing is futile, apart from the power of God, we would pray desperate prayers. <laughs> we would pray desperate prayers. We would pray that our church would really see Jesus for who he is. 
and that we would really place all our hope and our trust in him. And that we would, by his spirit, sorry, that he would, by his spirit, inject his power into our service, our teaching, and our outreach. And I'll even go so far as to say, like Kathy Keller said to her husband, Tim, all those years ago, if we don't pray, church, in the end, we're not going to make it. We're not going to make it. The things we're dealing, we're all dealing with personally, they're too heavy for us. We need to know God more intimately and trust him more deeply. And what we've been tasked with is simply impossible. (laughs) Apart from the miracle of ongoing Holy Spirit-empowered living together. So, will you remember your church and your prayers? I hope today that you'll either commit for the first time or recommit yourself to that really simple but essential thing. Let's pray. Father, God, be glorified. Be glorified in this. Lord, please do. Do what only you can do that I am incapable of doing. Would you make me? God, I I can't even make myself. I can't even make myself be a consistently prayerful man, a man who remembers all the right things in prayer, a man who remembers to pray for his church. God, so by your spirit, I ask that the first act of power that you might do even right now, Holy Spirit, is to empower us to remember our church and our prayers so that we would grow in true knowledge of you and hope in you that we would all walk in resurrection power to accomplish the things that you've set out for us to do. We can't do it without you. Help. Help, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.